Saint Giles Files. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's episode of the Saint Giles Files. I've been doing quite a good job of linking the episodes of late. Partly, I think, because the subjects often make me think a bit deeper on one subject and then I I carry on that thought process. Partly just because St. Giles is always going to have a link somewhere and I just keep finding the the, the nuance and link uh, in each thing. So this week then, I want to talk to you a little bit about interpretation in in, in St. Giles. Interpretation meaning how we tell people what things are. So how we interpret the building for visitors who might not know what it is. So what I'll do, again, as I've said, as usual every week, choose an object, choose some more objects in St Giles, and then widen it out to a bit more of a broad discussion. So the object that I will present to you today, once again, I'm being fairly liberal with the word object, I'm going to present to you what we call the North Porch screen, or sometimes called the Victoria screen. So if you've been into St Giles, you will know this screen as if you were stood in the sanctuary looking north, so if you were stood with the organ to your back looking forwards, you would see this grey stone screen. Incredibly gothic, I would say almost to the point of being gaudy, very over-decorated. So the North Porch screen then dates from just after the Chamber's restoration. Oh, sorry, is the, the kind of the back end of it. And it has his motto in the middle. And it's actually one of my favourite funny things of St Giles, where um, William Chambers, who is famous, again, for the Chambers Dictionary, it has his coat of arms on it, and his motto is in Latin, but it reads in English, deeds, not words, which I think is very funny for a man that wrote, wrote the dictionary. But anyway, on then, there are figures on the North Port screen, and from right to left... Uh, sorry, from... <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I had to get right, the direction. From left to right, we start off with St. Simon, who represents the weavers, St. Anne, who represents the tailors, then it's St. Joseph, who represents the carpenters, St. John for the masons, St. Bartholomew for the glovers, St. Clement for the skinners and tanners, St. Anthony for the butchers, St. Eloy for the hammermen, St. Crispin for the cobblers, and St. Cuthbert for the bakers. So you will see on the on the screen, you will see each of the crafts almost supporting their respective saint. And you'll be able to see who they are based on their craft often. So, for example, the weavers have a big bit of draped cloth. The, the, the skinners and tanners, I think, have a, a sheep with them, possibly. The hammermen have a huge anvil. So, and the, the, the bakers, I believe, are kneading bread. So it's quite easy to tell who they all are based on, on the, the uh, depiction of the guild, the guild itself. Some of them, I believe, aren't the, necessarily the traditional saint, and I'm not entirely sure how they chose the, the guilds on, on the screen. Anyway, um, regardless of that, that is the North Port screen. It's not my favourite thing in St Giles, but it's, 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 well, it's certainly there. <laughs> uh, and I think it d- demonstrates the... The Victorians, again, bringing Gothic to a a new Gothic level. But I suppose the question today then is, how would you know what that is unless we told you? And the way it links to last week then is in telling people what the object is, we remove the opportunity for a myth or a slight warping of history to be attached to an object or a, a piece of a building. So what I want to do then is talk about a few other things other than the, 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 the Northport screen in St Giles that you could be confused about. The easiest one I often think are the banners in the Press Nile. So the banners in the Press Nile are a collection of colourful banners, heraldic banners, which one could be forgiven for thinking that they were something to do with clans or something to do with military, but they are actually the banners for the Knights of the Order of the Thistle. Uh, in, in other heraldic orders, you will find those banners might well be in a chapel or an area in which the, the order meets. 
For us, they wouldn't really fit in the Thistle Chapel, so they've been put in the Press Nile, which is also our Chapel Royal in St Giles, as I've mentioned before. So that's what those banners are. And as heraldic devices, they might be quite hard to read. So you might need some interpretation for us to tell you exactly what the heraldry means and how, how to, to read heraldry. Some of it, especially the newer banners, are a bit easy to read, uh, like Lord Cullen of White Kirk as a white church. That's fairly self-explanatory. Some of the older ones are like the clue with the, the moons and the stripes can be a bit trickier. So in that situation, then we might need an information board or some interpretation just to give you a bit of an idea as to what you're looking at. But I do think it's a sliding scale. And what I mean by that is some things need entire interpretation, whereas some things you might be able to glean some of the history and then for us to fill in the gaps which you might not have been able to, to connect up yourself. So other things like E.T., for example. Now, you can already tell that's an old stone. So we don't need to tell you it's an old stone because you can tell it's worn. You can tell it's a scary face that's been carved in a reasonably rudimentary manner, so you might assume it's old. So you can tell that's an old stone in itself. So there's less confusion and less scope for a myth to spring up with it. But then we do maybe need to finish off telling you exactly what it is, just to give you the how old or where it was or where it came from, that type of thing. But then I suppose other things like, for example, some of the stained glass, which has its own interpretation as to when exactly it was from and who it was for. Uh, some of the scenes are fairly obvious, for example, in the nativity, regardless of, of, of what branch of Christianity you are. And I would almost assume regardless of what religion you are, you might have a good idea as to a nativity scene, given that as a, a Western religion, Christianity has, well, almost been quite good at pushing the nativity around. So those type of things we might need less interpretation for. And other objects, for example, the angel font, for anyone who has been into a church will know what a font probably looks like and what you're looking for in a font. The fact that it's regularly filled with water shows that most people know what to use it for. So probably for certainly Western Christians, all that remains is for us to tell you where the font was made and perhaps give you a bit of background to it. We don't really need to tell you it's a font, here's what it was used for. Although I suppose if we're being responsible um, interpretation, we would do all that anyway, just in case you were visiting from a culture or religion that might not know what a font was. But I'm sure you see my point that some objects might need interpretation entirely for everyone, whereas others might need less for some. Anyway, and I think this, this probably brings me quite nicely onto the debate for today, which I shall give a bit of a an introduction to in saying that this debate is not about, or sorry, this, this discussion that I'll introduce is not about whether St. Giles is a church or a museum. That is quite easy to conflate with the, the, the discussion I'll present in a second. And it frustrates me no end when people say, oh, well, it can't be a museum or it can't be a heritage site. It's a church. And I think we've no choice over that. For a building like St Giles, there is no St Giles. There is no choice over whether this is a museum or a church or a heritage site in a church, because regardless of how we might present it, it it is always both. Once a church and it's still an active church reaches a thousand years old as St Giles nearly is, surely, surely, it's a heritage site by default. We don't have a choice. So many things have happened there that you can't just say, "Oh, well, we only use it on a Sunday, therefore it's a church." No, unfortunately, always a heritage site. And the same, I suppose, is it, it fits for it being a heritage site. If it's still a working church, then it's always a church. You know, if people worship there at any point, in any way, in any style, it's a church. So to, to suggest that, that we have two options for a building is absolute nonsense. And I think, again, to touch on last week's podcast of how the building is used, well, what we have to do is cater for people whose main objective is worship. They have to be able to use the building. But then also we have to cater for people whose main aim is to experience Scottish history. And as keepers of such a site, it's our responsibility to make sure we can cater for them too. We can't ignore the, 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 the site as a historic site. And in the same way, we can't ignore it as a site for worship as well, whether that be Sunday morning or Tuesday afternoon. So that's the basis then. Well, sorry, that's the, the, the caveat to this discussion. This discussion is not about whether it's one or the other because it's always both. So with that in mind, then, our discussion is how much interpretation 
or how many how much information explanation how much of that we should have in St Giles now I think in a museum it's a very easy question you can have as much as you like to explain the object a quick speedy edit from me here that last sentence or that last bit as much as you like seems a bit crass I think you should have as much as you need not just as much as you want or will fit this point will make more sense as you listen to, to the rest of it, so I'll, I'll stop the edit there. Because the object has less context, or maybe less what I'm going to call, this is a term I've made up, so don't quote it, less authentic context. So you can interpret it because it's in a context that it wasn't meant to be in, or sorry, might not have been designed to be in. But in the building, so in St Giles, it might be a little trickier. I think it, it's quite hard to put a value on the awe of the building. So what I mean by that is when you come in to kind of go, oh wow, to, 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 to be amazed by whatever you're seeing or to be able to even at a slightly lower level than amazed to be to experience what you're seeing as 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 an authentic place. So, for example, to walk into St Giles and know the stories that have occurred there and to know that this is where they happened is quite a powerful thing. And I could completely and utterly imagine someone thinking that signage or information will detract from that or distract from that because you might remove the the authenticity of the building. It might if you if if everyone just kind of walks around reading signs, you could imagine someone not taking enough time to appreciate the building that they're actually in to re remember that this is where it actually happened. But I think the problem with that last sentence is it. Remember where it happened. Appreciate where it happened. Well, remember and appreciate where what happened. If someone doesn't know what the building is or how they should experience it, then there's no hope of them finding any useful experience from it. And so I think possibly where I side on this issue is we have to interpret the building in a way that detracts as l least as possible from making one unable to experience the building. So for example, what we shouldn't do is have a sea or a forest of signs that cover up all the things that one might, one might want to see. But we also have to make sure that people can still understand what they're seeing. So, for example, if you walk in and you've never heard of Gothic architecture, well, we probably need to tell you what Gothic architecture is. And I think um, one the prime example of where architecture, for me, has been best explained is at King's College in Cambridge. So they have very little, actually, in the, the central... Uh, well, I'm not sure if you would call it a nave. Let's call it a nave in King's College. And then the side aisles, they have lots of different interpretation, one of which is a vaulted ceiling recreation, which they have with a mirror, and they explain all the different things of what vaulting means and how it's gothic and that type of thing. So you get that explanation. Then you can walk back into the main, the, cent the central section of King's and appreciate what you've just learned in situ. So I think that worked quite nicely. But then St. Giles, whilst it is a good example architecturally has so many stories and where do and how do we tell those stories as well is one of our main problems I think because it wouldn't be appropriate to have tons and tons and tons of signs telling you all about John Knox telling you all about Jenny Geddes but we have to do it somehow because it's our responsibility as the site where these events occurred to help people learn Scottish history I mean that's my job to, to help people learn Scottish history so that's our our, our aim and our our challenge I suppose and perhaps to contrast it again with a museum where you can walk in and you're immediately expecting to see objects with interpretation the challenge for us is to provide that interpretation for objects or sites whilst also making sure that people can experience the historic site itself and so as I've said the challenge is how we do that some signage probably is necessary to interact with people who like to read signs we can probably use some new technology which allows us to interpret the building without having to put things around the building. And I think at the moment as well, it is something we are 
acutely aware of coming out of the back of of, of COVID and, and and coronavirus. The the first time I've mentioned that possibly in the main body of the 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 podcast, but it's something that we want to get right because we're very aware that in the short run our visitors will be mainly Scottish, possibly mainly UK based, and they might well have heard of St Giles or they might well have thought they have some preconceptions about it. And it's for us to almost test our new ideas out on these these visitors, which we'll be doing, by the way. So if you are listening to this and you're a Scottish local or a, a, a someone from the UK thinking about coming up, we've got a few new ideas that we'd like to to, te- to test on you. Um, and also for international listeners, we'll, we'll try and do some of those tests uh, in the virtual world as well. So to return to the test point, we have to try and interpret the building in a new way for people who might have already heard the history. And that is a a fascinating challenge because it will give us an idea as to what interpretation works well, because these people will know the history possibly, and will be looking for interesting ways to read it once again. And so hopefully it will allow us or guide us better along the tricky tightrope of having too much interpretation and making sure people can still experience an authentic building but also managing to cut through that what can often be elitism of people who have been taught how to interpret an old building and people who haven't and still making sure that they can both have a meaningful experience and and a, a learning experience in a building as important as St Giles. And I probably won't even get started on how different age groups might like to have a building interpreted based on how they have visited in the past. I think we, we, we can leave that for another day. Let's leave it there maybe in the challenges an authentic building faces when providing interpretation whilst trying to make sure people can still experience the building itself. Right, I think that'll do then. Thank you very much. Speak to you next week. As usual, uh, a bit of a, an end note from me. Let's hope that we're coming to the end of this, as it appears we might be, and let's let's all try and stick together and make sure we don't have a second wave. Certainly in Scotland, it appears we're doing quite a good job of that. Despite the good job we might be doing at the moment, St Giles has still missed out on income for pretty much four months. That's put, put us in a bit of a, a tricky situation, but our managing body, the Kirk Session, are still paying the extra top-up of the furlough scheme, which means we're still spending a lot of money which we're not making. So if you are listening to this and you can give us uh, any donation that you're able to, please do. Thanks. Bye.